So let's begin the session two, that is on economy. The theme of this session is post-COVID economic recovery. What difficulties will we face? So over to Ms. Kudo to moderate. Uh, Josh, thank you very much. Uh, excellent moderation. I really enjoyed the session. So we now go into the second session. More than the session one, maybe we will have difficult discussions, but we have really excellent uh, speakers who are suitable for discussing this important um, question. We have a guest from China. We have uh, Carlos from uh, across the globe. And um, I'd like to first share guiding questions. First of all, a macroeconomic recovery, as has been discussed already, with the uh, vaccination program rolling out, um, the recovery seems uh, faster than we expected. Uh, having said that, this economic recovery and also the exit itself, uh, can, I, can we be so optimistic about those? because of the uh, ballooning government uh, debts and also um, completely different uh, dimensional uh, monetary policies as well as the uh, debt accumulation in developing countries as the economy recovers, the interest rates may be raised. So we need to have a very good management of the exit uh, strategy in order to have soft landing. Another guiding question is, our response to coronavirus are, are very different across the countries. This was a global pandemic, global crisis. However, we did not have international cooperation. This is due partly because of the governance as an issue, which we will be discussing tomorrow. But in the background of that failure, there is an issue of globalization. As has been mentioned already, the uh, economic disparities is one and uh, um, the uh, um, middle um, class has been destroyed in each country. And then we have seen division and disparities and gap between the rich and the poor. And then the confrontation between the US and China, this is aggravating. So how does it play a role in terms of the entire issue of globalization? When it comes to digital, we already see the digital divide. Against this backdrop, based on the technological innovation of digital platformers, have we been able to form rules? And so these are the challenges of globalization that we need to question. And on top of that, we have this pandemic that is compounding with those challenges. And if that is the case, when we think about the recovery of the coronavirus a pandemic, we also need to address the issue of globalization at the same time. So in the post-COVID-19 world, in our recovery effort, we have a lot of challenges that we need to address. So what kind of answers can we pose? So that is a kind of a guiding question. I'd like to ask the four panelists or guests to give us each eight minutes a discussion on these points. And after that, we will have a, a free discussion. We have uh, Mr. Rohinton and others. So I'd like to ask uh, each one of those uh, four guests to give us eight minutes views on these questions. I'd like to first invite the Japanese guest um, the uh, um, Vice Minister of Finance in charge of uh, currency as well as the finance of the government. We have Ken Kenji Okamura to give us his views on this very important issue. Over to you, Mr. Okamura. Sorry. Um, yes, yes, I, I'm here. Thank you for your introduction, Mr. Kudo. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful opportunity for discussion. As I have attended various international conferences such as uh, G7 and others, I, I'd like to share my views on the challenges of the economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. So today's theme is restoration. Uh, of 
the global economy from the coronavirus pandemic. And I stay optimistic, but the most important issue in my view is the white widening gap in many respects. And the reason for my optimism is because of the global economies, um, the, uh, the root cause of this um, crisis was the fundamental nature of this crisis. This crisis has been caused by an external shock, not by an internal cause of the economic system, as in previous currency or financial crisis. And external shocks do not mean the physical destruction of infrastructure, as in natural disasters, such as earthquakes or floods. The essence of an economic shock is the artificial restriction of economic activity in order to control infection. Therefore, as the infection is contained and economic activity resumes, economic recovery is quite inevitable on a macro level. Of course, we have to be careful about uncertainty because we are in the middle of a race between virus mutations and vaccines and the risk of a resurgence of infection and there will be ups and downs. But broadly speaking, recovery is inevitable. The question is, remains how fast. So if we understand the nature of the crisis in this way, the basic policy response will be a combination of short-term support measures to buy time until the economic, economy resumes and meet to long-term measures that look ahead. The short-term support measures are those that work on a broad basis, such as large-scale monetary easing measures and cash transfers to households and businesses. Mid- and long-term support is targeted to strengthen growth, for example, by promoting digital and green investment. All countries have implemented massive fiscal and monetary easing measures, which have had the effect, as Mr. Kudo said, the global economic recovery has already begun ahead of the containment of the infection itself. So towards exit strategies, the major challenge for all countries is the accumulation of massive government debt. In particular, Japan had a huge public debt to GDP ratio of 260% even before the pandemic. And I have been asked whether Japan's inability to draw and exit the strategy will not be a source of difficulty for the global economy. But my answer is no, Japan will be all right. So what would be Japan's scenario first? Super easing of monetary policy continues given the per persistence of low inflation. Uh, secondly, fiscal policy begins to shift towards targeting. The debt to GDP ratio will stabilize, albeit at a high level, due to the continued low interest rate environment. Third, since the accumulation of government debt, even if inflation is far away, hampers the efficiency of resource allocation and growth potential, full-fledged fiscal consolidation efforts should be resumed as soon as the economic recovery is established. And in my view, the key point here is to prevent the rise in long-term interest rates in the United States from spreading to Japan. In this context, the biggest problem is widening disparities. And of course, the disparities within each country is a huge problem, but a difficulty facing the global economy is the disparities between developed countries and developing countries. So I'd like to talk about that. So, um, the, um, this uh, kind of a disparity is uh, seen in the debt crisis, and I think uh, this uh, debt crisis or potential debt crisis is the biggest risk of the world economy. If so the uh, debt explosion or a series of events uh, can trigger a um, crisis in the world economy, and this has been accelerated by uh, the corona pandemic and the uh, U.S. Uh, interest rate rise and the rise of the dollars may trigger a debt crisis in developing countries in no because of the rising cost of debts. So aggressive uh, China's uh, debt diplomacy or debt trap uh, has always already been there. And also developed countries are losing uh, its capacity for accommodating such situation. 
Uh, so uh, G20 and others are making serious efforts to avert a debt crisis right now. And in this context, the biggest challenge is, uh, to be very specific, China's insistence on its own rules, which differ from international rules. So more specifically, the country has placed its huge policy bank, the National Development Bank, outside the international debt restructuring framework of public creditors, claiming that it is a private bank and hiding its true nature by not complying with data disclosure. And this is a serious obstacle for the creditor countries to share the burden fairly and to solve the problems in the debt restructuring talks of individual countries. In order to avoid a global crisis caused by debt dominoes, China, which has become the largest creditor nation, must take the initiative in participating in an international framework based on one common rule. Next, I'd like to talk about the future of globalization. I believe that the fundamental difficulty facing globalization is the widening gap between the rich and the poor, and the coronavirus crisis has brought this home to us. On the other hand, the pandemic has also shed a positive light on the prospects for globalization. For instance, for instance, digital technologies offer alternatives to physical exchange as in this virtual international conference, and economic recovery is building momentum to promote green investment as in build back better. I believe that it is impossible to reverse the course of globalization, and therefore, taking into account both the challenges and the opportunities presented by the pandemic. What we should aim for in the future is not to correct the excess of globalization, but rather to catch up with the policy responses that have lagged behind the actual progress of globalization. With this in mind, I'd like to introduce the issue of digital taxation as an example of how international cooperation can help to address the difficulties of globalization. The IT giants are emblematic of the economic inequalities brought about by globalization and are a classic case of policy lagging behind economic reality in the sense that tax rules have not kept pace with multinationals doing business in cyberspace. The United States was at odds with Europe and other countries when it proposed a business choice system called Safe Harbor, and then as a concrete manifestation of the Biden administration's return to multilateralism, Treasury Secretary Yellen announced at the G20 in February that the Safe Harbor proposal would be withdrawn. In the wake of this, there is a great deal of momentum to reach agreement on a global solution before the mid-year deadline. The issue is a landmark effort to achieve agreement on a multilateral framework for new rules to deal with the challenges posed by globalization. The OECD's inclusive framework, the forum for this discussion, includes 139 countries. This is a critical moment to see if multilateralism can deliver against the challenges of globalization. I'd like to ask you for your support in this regard. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Okamura. So, uh, unlike me, uh, he is opti um, he has optimism about the situation. So, uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Zemin from China. So, the China is the first country in the world uh, to recover from COVID-19, and uh, coupled with the uh, very big challenges in the uh, uh, geopolitical arena, the fact that the uh, China uh, is ahead of other countries in terms of recovery uh, from COVID-19, that's what the uh, uh, other countries are most interested in. From your viewpoint, what 
what's your view about the prospect of the recovery uh, from the um, recovery uh, from the COVID-19? You used to be the uh, vice um, um, chief of the um, IMF, and uh, he he was um, uh, also the um, in the um, uh, Chinese government heading the um, physical policies. So you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It is indeed a great, great honor for me to join this conference and particularly uh, join this uh, uh, panel with this very, very distinguished panelist. Indeed, it's a great honor. And thank, thank you once again for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> asked about the uh, about Chinese economy and also uh, about excess strategy for the whole world, including China. I think this is clearly a very important issue. China had a 2.3% GDP growth rate last year, you know, much lower than China's standard ever, right? But still, it's pretty good V-shape in a rebound. I mean, the V-shape rebound is very much supported by two key issues. One is a very strong exports. Another one is uh, very strong investments. Strong export actually is not effective. Consumption is still weak, so uh, and relatively consumption growth is still at the negative regime due to the bad pandemics. So move to this year, I think the domestic policy will more focus on domestic consumption support while maintaining a strong policy on investments. Because trade is not all clear. Although in the first two months, China's export doing quite well, but still, I think the picture is not all clear. So the policy will focus on these two things, and uh, <clears throat> monetary policy and the fiscal policy remain more or less at the current level to support stabilities. But more importantly, China just over $10,000 per capita GDP, and a move toward high income status now. And at this level, a few things will happen, or usually we call a middle income trap. But more than that, I think the one thing is in this particular stage, the economy usually have a big economic structure change, particularly from manufacturing industry to service sector. Um, all the countries include Japan, US, in the, around per capita GDP 10,000, and the economy structure moving to service sector away from the industry. China had the same experience. Chinese manufacturing peaked in terms of share of GDP around 2014 and all the way down. And uh, now today, service sector account 54% of GDP now. Chinese uh, economy is a service economy now. But the challenge is, we use the input output table data calculation. The service sector in average productivity is roughly 30% lower than industry or manufacturing. So in the next five years, for example, we expect to see service sector increase another 3% uh, in terms of uh, uh, shares in GDP. But if we cannot change that, so 1% of service sector increase in share of GDP, we lost 0.3% of the labor productivity. So in that sense, on the growth will be slower. I think the second major challenge is really demographic change and the longevity. China moving into the age of society really, really rapidly. And uh, we did a very simple forecasting compared with 2050 with today, what well, we found net increase the population in terms of cohorts, really all in aged people. Around the 60, age 6 group cohorts increased 80 million people. At the age of 70 cohorts, net increase 100 million. Around age 80 cohorts, net increase once again 80 million. And all the other groups, 50, 40, 30, 20, will have a net loss. So China has become 
aging society much more dramatic than we thought. We learn from our Japanese economies and we China is facing huge domestic structure change and the policy and also financial and sector and investment saving behavior change. So then in the long term, China needs really to do a very fundamental structure reform and structure change to move into this new situation. In that sense, we also need a, a supportive monetary and a fiscal policy to help the smooth transition. So in that sense, I think that China's monetary policy, fiscal policy will more or less stay. And fortunately, uh, China did not have a very big stimulus package in year 2020. So we still have enough fiscal space and monetary policy space. Now on the access strategy, the real issue is on the US. We expect to see US will have a very strong economic growth. We forecast away the Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus package. US growth probably will hit around 6%. Since third quarter of this year, US growth rates will be roughly 3% above their potential economic growth. That's put a tremendous pressures on inflation. And plus, this recovery all will be uneven, driven by service and also by household consumption. Manufacturing recovery is still relatively slow. And uh, in that sense, we will see the price may increase at the different department, different sector, which may trigger an overinflation expectation and then cause the market volatility and the Fed take action, take the early exit. What happened in the bonds market in the US in the past few weeks so clearly tell us market is very vulnerable. I think this is a really a, 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 a potential risk. A strong US growth is really good, it's welcome for everyone because we support global economic recovery. But if it's triggered inflation, as Larry Summers publicly argued, right, inflation may come back and strongly, I tend to agree with him because I see US will have a strong and uneven recovery and inflation is hidden here and there, it may come in rapidly. So in that sense, if we fair to take early action, exit to the monetary policy, because inflation hit the 2% targets, I think that will have a huge impact on the whole world as well. And uh, particularly, if we further take early action, I think it's very challenging for US economy because the US took a $5 trillion stimulus package, more than 20% of their GDP. So you, they, you, they need a continuous support at the physical level and the monetary policy level. If we fail to take uh, early actions, it will also create a difficulty path for US economic yeah, growth. So overall, I think my time is over, uh, roughly on. So I will stop here. I'm looking forward to further discussion with the panelists and with other guests. Thank you once again very much. Hi, Domo. Thank you very much. So basically, China requires structural reform uh, as an exit uh, strategy. The U.S. inflation seems to be the biggest issue. So now, uh, Mr. Adam Paulson from the U.S., I'd like to ask him for his views um, based on what uh, Mr. Xu Ming from China has said in terms of the recovery of the coronavirus pandemic. What are the issues for the U.S., Mr. Paulson? Thank you very much for including me in this year's conference. And I am like Minju and because of Minju, very honored to be on this distinguished panel with colleagues and friends, including Vice Minister Okamara. Let me make my remarks in two three minute chunks. First on the US outlook and second on the international agenda for recovery from the US position. 
In terms of the U.S. outlook, I think we can all agree that there is this massive fiscal push in the U.S. I think it has to be seen as the Biden administration views itself as having one shot to fend off a uh, disastrous political outcome. We saw the insurrection on January 6th in the Capitol. Uh, this is very serious issues in the U.S. And so the idea essentially, though they won't say it is failure, is not an option. There must be a recovery. There must be distribution. There must be a material improvement in people's lives beyond the usual economic and health issues. And I think that this package will be successful. The, the issue is twofold. First, there is a chunk of the package, roughly a quarter, that is the direct payments to individuals beyond what is being paid out to state and local governments, beyond what is being paid out to actually work the vaccines. Um, those other three quarters or 70% of the package are not only very functional, but also very likely to be self-limiting. The state and local governments, some of them are in better shape and they will bank the money for later. The vaccine spending, once, it's, once the vaccines are done, spending ends. It is these stimulus checks to individuals that are the contentious part. Um, and so the outlook is very critically dependent on what you think is the multiplier on those stimulus checks to individuals and whether or not there is pent up demand. My view is that we will have uh, what Larry Summers has called overheating, but not necessarily to such an enormous degree. Um, there are two factors at work in my view. The first is that the savings behavior of Americans, while much less inclined to high levels of savings than many Asians and many, most other rich countries, frankly, um, do change as a result of circumstances. We saw the household savings rate after transition dynamics stay roughly 2% higher after the 2008 crisis than it was beforehand. And I would expect a similar persistent rise in the uh, precautionary savings motive of American households following this crisis, the second crisis in the last 10 to 12 years, particularly for younger people. And while that is not going to forestall the, recession, the boom we're about to have, which will probably be more like seven or 8% growth in 2021, it is enough to damp down the long-term effects of this. A second factor is that there's a lot of discussion about what is called pent-up savings and pent-up demand whether the people who have been holding off on various kinds of purchases will make them in the next year. And Fed Chair Powell made reference to the fact there's only so many restaurant meals you can eat, even if you skipped a full year. Others have made reference to the idea that, that haircuts, you know, even if you're not looking like me, that there's only a limited number of haircuts you can catch up on. But not all services are like that. The most important piece of the services sector in the US, as in most countries, but particularly in the US, is the healthcare sector, which makes up 18 to 20 percent of GDP. And we have seen very large postponements in what we would call elective procedures in the US healthcare sector, because people were afraid of making use of the medical system during COVID, and the medical system had other priorities. These elective procedures procedures run the definition of gambit from cosmetic things to cancer treatment. And almost all of them will be expressed as soon as possible. And so we are likely to have a very large inflation boost from healthcare. Um, but it is also very clearly going to be temporary and finite. So the final point, and this is where my colleague Joseph Gagnon has written some interesting pieces for Peterson and others, including myself, come out, is to say that you can have a boom, but whether this leads to terrible overheating and other effects depends on the Federal Reserve, as Minshew implied. And so what do we think is going to happen with the Federal Reserve? Will they be able to look through what is clearly a temporary overheating factor? And that is unknown. 
Um, I believe very strongly that Chair Powell and the other members of the FOMC want to look through a one-time shock to inflation, that they believe running the economy is both politically and economically essential. And there's increasingly widely held argument consisting with things I have written through the years that the difference between the 70s high inflation and now isn't just that you suddenly have a more credible regime, it was a buildup of many structural factors over many years, including on the fiscal front that led to the inflation of the 70s. It wasn't just a one-time mistake by Arthur Burns. And so if you look at it that way, one can be more hopeful that the Fed can get through the one-time shock without major inflation. But it's going to be very difficult to know. And I think the spillovers on the international economy will come through interest rate volatility in the U.S. forward interest rate markets, not so much a huge jump in levels, but quite a bit of two-way uncertainty about long-term interest rates that we have not seen for quite some time. Finally, I believe I'm almost out of time, a couple of marks on the international system of where the U.S. might be. I think it was very important to hear the agenda as set out by Vice Minister Okamura and also the reference to the declining importance of manufacturing by Jumin in China and elsewhere. I think the US, the Biden administration is doing a very mixed bag. On one ground, they're being very positive. They have, as Vice Minister Okamura mentioned, made a real opening on the international tax coordination front on corporate tax. And I think Secretary Yellen has been quite clear on this, and this is going to be a positive major initiative. Similarly, I think the Biden administration is clearly being much more constructive internationally on a broad range of topics, including the uh, provision of vaccines. But we have a very problematic issue that the Biden administration shares with the Trump administration, which is a lot of talk about the important factions, which is being for the US and for the world. And I'm hopeful, but not expecting in the short term, the Biden administration to get past this mistaken focus. Thank you. Uh, I don't Thank you very much. Lastly, on the other side uh, from Japan, on the other side of the globe, Carlos, and you, what did you think of uh, those three uh, previous speakers? their talks. Uh, I, I, I have the impression uh, that I could add something by saying the following. Uh, the pandemic in a certain way mimics something that has happened 500 years ago, which was the introduction by Martin Luther of a demand for Bibles. Gutenberg had invented the printed press, the modern printed press, around 1440. 80 years later, at that time things moved very slowly, Martin Luther uh, issued the idea that you could communicate directly with God. You only had to read the Bible. And because of that, there was a huge increase in demand for printed Bibles. And of course, the supply, the possibility of supply was there. That changed the world. People started reading and writing in modern Europe. And science came just after religion and uh, it started developing. The modern world comes out of that. Now, because of the pandemic, we have moved into digitalization. We already had Skype, we already had Teams, we already have Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, and others. But we were not using them. I have had Zoom at my institution for five years. They, were, they have been experimenting with it for five years. 
was too boring to learn. Because of a pandemic, we had to stop using it. And the important thing is not this feature of communication between us, which is very comfortable because I am in Brazil, Mr. Posen is in the US, uh, Kudosan is in Tokyo, and we are capable of uh, articulating our views, exchanging our views from different points of the globe. Important thing is that in uh, some of these softwares, you have ecosystems of softwares that allow companies to change deeply how they function, how they do business. In the military language, uh, you may say that the C3I2 of a company, the command control, communication, information, and intelligence was compressed upwards. What does it mean? It means that the middle class is going to lose their jobs. The result of the pandemic is a deep structural change in the structure of labor. That is going to be less important in countries like the US, which have a tradition of adapting themselves very fast. But it will be very important in other countries. This will create a huge impact, and it's already creating a huge impact in countries which depend heavily on the service sector. So my first point is this, the going, the world after the pandemic is not the same world as it was before because we have uh, somehow launched a competition that you cannot avoid plunging into. If you just try not to modernize, you'll be out of a market. Your cost will be too big. And this is going to create a structure of unemployment. The second thing is, just because the US has been printing money, and a lot of money, doesn't mean that you are going to have inflation all at once. This will only happen if that money gets into the market too fast. What it means is that people are going to get checks on their mailboxes. They are going to spend this and you are going to reactivate what you may call the Russell 3500 uh, companies. The companies on the service sector, the companies on the mid-sized companies in the service sector, in the consumption sector and so forth. This will, of course, improve their credit conditions and money will flow into the US. So the US, by creating a deficit, probably is going in the short run not to have inflation, but to have an inflow of people bringing money in order to profit from higher returns higher returns. And this will push up the dollar higher. It is likely. If the dollar goes higher, what will happen to the rest of the world? They will feel an inflationary pressure. Here in Brazil, we are starting to think, uh, are we going to have an inflationary pre uh, pressure because of a dollar? which we have already devalued our currency a lot, but is it going to, to continue? What is going to happen? So things are not as obvious as they seem. The capacity of the US to adapt its economy very fast, the capacity to recover very fast from, from the pandemic compared to others because of vaccination, the capacity of having the most developed uh, credit market in the world, this makes a difference. And this is going to play a very big role in the next two years. The Federal Reserve has said, oh, don't look for higher interest rates before 2023. There is a reason for that. They are not thinking, I presume, they are not thinking that uh, inflation will explode in the year. So simple uh, quantitative uh, reasonings saying, well, you doubled the M2 
and therefore inflation has to go up very fast. We should be careful with that. Uh, we should be careful with that. Uh, and that puts a challenge. That puts a challenge because in countries like my own, we'll be under inflationary pressures because of the trade of uh, the tradable goods. We will be having the shock of a pandemic. We have a huge 65% of our economy uh, service sector. And we, of course, are not so well integrated between the service and industrial sector. And this will create a structural, this will persist, uh, make a uh, persistent structural unemployment, which of course has political implications. So, I think that we are in for, at least from my point of view as a Brazilian, we are in for a, a two-year difficult uh, period. It's not going to be an easy game for us. And I presume that for many other countries, it won't be as easy uh, as that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. We just heard from four speakers about their position on the exit. Uh, rather than looking at the exit as um, um, with the optimism, we think we have to be very careful. And Carlos pointed out that it's not going to be an easy game. And one of the factors that is at play, which is important, is inflation that uh, absorbs the shocks as much as possible to have a soft landing. But then appreciation of dollar and going up of the interest rate in the United States, which in turn has impact on emerging markets. Mr. Okamura spoke about the uh, accumulating debts uh, as a problem in developing countries, which means that this uh, coronavirus pandemic, um, the problem brought forward is multifold. But I would like to ask uh, two other guests in this uh, discussion about their views. After listening to what they have to say, these four speakers, what are your biggest concerns because of this uh, coronavirus and how should we respond to that? Mr. Rohinton first, I'll give you three minutes. Kudosan, thank you uh, for having me. I should say, like many people, my last uh, trip on an airplane was coming home to Toronto from your conference in Tokyo a year ago. I took the Air Canada flight two days early because we knew things were going to go south big time. And since then, it's been, as Carlos was saying, um, catching up with Zoom and technologies that we were trying to avoid for many years in the think tank and other worlds. Um, in, in reacting to the presentations that have been made, uh, three or four points come to mind uh, in my three minutes. And I'd say, overall, I'm cautiously optimistic about the global economy, perhaps more emphasis on cautious than optimism uh, for four reasons. Uh, number one, uh, and these have all been covered by, by our speakers, vaccine rollout. Uh, I think we should understand that although in some parts of the world, vaccine rollout is advancing in ways that lead to optimism, that is not the case around the world. And this is one case because of the positive and negative spillover effects of this technology, you really need a broad-based application of it. And so to the extent that large parts of the world at present rates and at present prices and IP rules are not going to be vaccinated until 2022, 2023, you're vulnerable economically, never mind the health uh, and, and ethical issues, which we should be thinking about, but let's say never mind them. Um, mutants and variants will keep developing in parts of the world that are not vaccinated. They will then come back to haunt the countries that are, and however quick the the new technologies might be to uh, counteract it, we will always be one step behind. Second, uh, even if the motors of growth are increasingly, let's say, China and the US, 
The fact is, if you count the developing countries that are not covered by a broad-based vaccine rollout and increasingly count the European Union, which has become a laggard, that's about you know, 40 to 50 percent of global, global aggregate demand. So having an uneven vaccine rollout, by definition, will lead to uh, an uneven uh, and broken economic recovery. Second point, um, fiscal space, again, has mirrored the vaccine rollout. Uh, developed countries could spend 26% um, of their GDP on average on um, um, uh, fiscal uh, uh, stimulation. Emerging markets, 6%, developing countries, 2%. So I think we have to understand that the capacity to respond and rebuild social safety nets or not is again a function of this very uneven space we have here. I should say that Janet uh, Yellen's letter and the new US Treasury position on SDRs and, and other forms of stimulus is a welcome relief. But I will end on this point that we had seen trends for some time ongoing. One is that when new technologies come out, and this, this point was made by our friend, a colleague from China, they don't show up in productivity growth right away. Uh, whether it's services sector broadly or whether it's digital technologies, as we saw two decades ago, it takes time for the digital revolution to show up in productivity growth. At the same time, it is broadly labor saving. And so a lot of countries will be scrambling to find development models that maintain labor absorption at rates that we've historically seen. When I put that all together, I think what we're seeing is um, uh, room to build back better as the slogan goes, but we're not there yet, we're far from it. I'll stop there. Hi. Uh, Thank you. Greco, do we have Greco uh, logged in? Italia is G20 presidency this year. Probably one of the challenges of the economic recovery uh, is shared by Italy. But what do you think, Mr. Greco? So many thanks, uh, Mr. Kudo. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be part of this panel. I would uh, emphasize uh, two main aspects related to what you call the exit strategy dilemma. Uh, the COVID-19 challenge and the future of our welfare system. So, as you know, many experts and scientists think that COVID-19 will become endemic, will continue to circulate for years. That's a factor that we should take into account when discussing the prospect of economic recovery. If the health crisis continues, we need to factor in the initial costs that this will imply, take into account the obstacles that this can create uh, to uh, the recovery. Unless uh, and until we manage effectively the pandemic on a global scale, not only on a regional scale or national scale, the recovery of economic activity risks to be come up against uh, uh, continuous stumbling blocks. In fact, there is a number of factors that can make uh, uh, the current pandemic uh, a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, one. But, uh, uh, of course, the most daunting challenge is how to distribute enough vaccine to the world population outside the rich world. I would emphasize the nexus between pandemic man management and economic uh, recovery, not least because uh, it's a central issue for the G20 this year. We, you know, the Italy has the, holds the presidency of G20. And so G20 can play a leading role in fostering cooperation for vaccine distribution. The Italian presidency is working also on a number of programs in the health sector, including uh, the international health regulation, uh, the implementation of COVAX, uh, the establishment of early warning mechanism, uh, and the strengthening of networks and platforms for timely and reliable exchange of information on, uh, on epidemics. Uh, but, of course, uh, another key issue is how to address uh, within the G20 uh, the risk of exposure or supply chain for essential medical goods. We know that the pandemic has put global supply chains under unprecedented stress. Supply chain security is a central issue. What we need is much higher degree of the nation in the field of procurement policies. So all those issues will be at the center of the G20 process this year, but obviously none of them has an easy response. Uh, 
Still, I think uh, it would be important if the G20 leaders take common and clear positions on these issues and express their support for the ongoing global health programs. Second, the issue of post-COVID economic recovery is clearly linked with the many question marks regarding the future of our welfare system. This issue is, of course, crucial for the actual possibility we can have to reduce inequalities, which indeed have expo exp exponentially grown as a result of the pandemic. The sustainability of welfare system has become a growing source of concern, especially in Europe, for a number of factors, in particular, the impact of the pandemic on welfare system and more broadly the role of state in the economy has been huge. It, it is unclear how European states and other states will deal with the specific pandemic legacy. The problem is uh, uh, how to switch from emergency measures to policies that are economically and socially sustainable. On one hand, it will be difficult to adopt measures to reverse the trend towards a larger involvement of state in the economy. On the other hand, we simply lack the financial resources needed to ensure such generous state support for the years to come. There have been growing calls for the introduction of universal basic income schemes, but the scarce resources make, uh, makes it uh, unlikely that the assistance programs introduced to deal with the economic effects of the pandemic can evolve into sustained basic income schemes. We have witnessed a huge expansion of the welfare state. There has been an unprecedented growth of uh, direct spending to support workers and households. And the end of the most acute phase of the pandemic will instead open uh, sooner or later a period of budget tightening. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, new budgetary rules will have to be restored, hopefully perhaps in a more modified, less strict form. There could be an agreement to reform the stability and growth pact, but the EU will have to maintain a watchful eye, especially on countries in financial trouble. Arguing in favor of risk sharing will become increasingly difficult. So the fiscal adjustment process will be painful and it will have far reaching social and political implications. If we want to preserve our social fabric, we should engage in such a difficult and unpopular adjustment process. The consensus around such reform plans will be extremely difficult to prove to be the Achilles heel of our democratic system. That's a factor that we should take into account when discussing the future of our democratic system, the central subject of the next session. So, to conclude, reform, innovation, and fiscal sustainability are all key components of the economic transformation we want to promote, and we should consider all of them in a comprehensive, with a comprehensive approach. Thanks. Thank you very much. So anyone else who has not really spoken yet in this session? I think everyone has. Okay. Now, I think um, the discussion has really converged around the difficulty which we face, which is lingering. Now I have a question. So how this post-COVID-19 recovery, the exit, how can we overcome this difficulty eventually? What are your views? Do we still not have any prospect of recovery just yet? Uh, Mr. Shumin from China, um, structural reform being necessary in China, but yet I think China is ahead in terms of economic recovery. The recovery is al already on the way in China. So the exit after the coronavirus pandemic, what are needed in order to have an exit from the coronavirus crisis? And what can China do in this regard? And I'd like to, uh, I'd like uh, Mr. Shumin to also touch upon what Mr. Okamura has said, which is about information sharing in terms of uh, a debt crisis of developing countries. Uh, China seems so reluctant to share such information. Mr. Shumin, please. Mr. Shumin, you're muted, I guess. You're muted. Yeah. 
The first issue is you mentioned about Chinese economy, and uh, yes, recovery is on the way, but we are more look about the long-term sustainability because that's the most important thing. We don't want to see a sort of a bumping around, you know. Uh, so in that sense, a uh, much more broad, deep structure reform and uh, supported by monetary and a fiscal policy, I think this is also very important. If China can have a sustainable growth, I think that would be very good for the region and for the whole world. So we expect China roughly have around 7% GDP growth this year. But more importantly, we hope China will maintain around 5% GDP growth rates in the next few years. I think that which is not an easy task because when you become bigger and bigger and the way the structure shift and uh, productivity and also potential growth rates tend to be slow, lower, right? So then uh, structure reform, particularly investing in the technology become the key issue. So that's a reason China spent a lot of effort and money investing in, I call it high technology, highway infrastructure, which is 5G, big data, AI, cloud, you know, to build infrastructure, so let company to leverage on those infrastructure to digitalize their own company, their own sector. I think then gradually move into a digitalized economy and maintain the sustainability of the growth. And this is the most important issue. On the debt issues you mentioned, and uh, China by bilateral, China is the major and the creditors for, 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 for quite a few developing country now. I think there's two issues. And one issue is the whole global level, the debt increase so dramatic, even including advanced economy, right? And the American debt jump from 100% of GDP to 130% of GDP, which is also a concern. And Japan, as the minister Okomura mentions, in the 274% of the debt is also a concern. So I think the advanced economy to maintain the debt sustainability, I think is a big issue. And for low-income country, debt sustainability, obviously, is a much more challenging issue. Actually, after the G20 last year, we have a common framework. China extend the debt for the low-income country for 12 months more, and also helped many, many uh, low-income country do the debt release and up to a few billion dollars now. So I think that China is doing its best to help the low-income country to move forward. I think all the international community should work together to understand each other, then see how can we help each other, help low-income country to move and help this country out of this debt issue. Well, thank you very much. I think um, there is some raise hand function here. So I would like to ask all the speakers if they want to speak up, please uh, use the raise hand uh, function. Mr. Okamura, we have a lot of debt in Japan. And uh, uh, right now, Mr. Shumin said that the China is helping low income countries in terms of debt relief. Mr. Okamura, what are those? Thank you very much. So first, in terms of a fiscal uh, health, uh, here in Japan, the fiscal health uh, is uh, quite poor, and that is uh, very bad, actually. So in my first remark, I already said that and this is a problem even before the coronavirus pandemic. And then uh, this uh, a problem in terms of the exit after the coronavirus, uh, this remains a vulnerability. 
and this is a problem of the public debt accumulating. And another problem is about the potential growth rate being quite low in Japan. And this is because of the low birth rate and uh, aging of the society, declining working population. As Mr. Xu Min pointed out, this is a kind of a problem that China is going to face going forward as well. Because of the aging of the society, we are seeing the decline in the potential growth rate. So these are the two problems that we are facing right now. So in the past of the recovery from the coronavirus, uh, I'm quite optimistic that we can recover in terms of the pandemic. However, uh, we still need to respond to uh, chronic diseases which were there already before the pandemic. We have to respond to them with policies like uh, promoting allocation in order to improve uh, productivity and we also need to uh, improve the total factor productivity, which requires digitalization and innovation, or a probably grown, green growth. We need to have targeted investment into those areas. So, so that's what I have to say about uh, the debt issue pointed out by Mr. Kudo. And to respond to the question of uh, debt, uh, the low income, uh, excuse me, low interest rate. Uh, this is one factor which gives me optimism that uh, we'll be able to go out of this uh, debt accumulation uh, crisis. And uh, this is actually rather ironic. We have a lot of uh, deflation our mind. So the uh, inflation expectation is not there so much. So even if uh, the interest rate goes up in the United States, whether this is going to come on shore of Japan or not, we'll be able to control that with the yield curve control. So this uh, super low interest rate environment, this can be continued. And therefore, although the debt level is quite high, uh, this is going to stay quite stabilized. And in the meantime, we can implement necessary policies. And finally, I'd like to touch upon uh, the debt um, issue of uh, uh, developing countries uh, of China. As Mr. Xu Min pointed out, we need to have international cooperation in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, this from developing into a real uh, fledged uh, crisis. We have a conventional uh, wisdom uh, centering around the Paris uh, Club. We have rules for uh, relief of debts and China should come together in this uh, common framework, G20 plus uh, also together with China. This is uh, to be implemented and we are at a critical juncture in implementing such a rule. But one thing that I wanted to say is uh, the uh, biggest uh, creditor, uh, China, and the policy bank, the National Development Bank of China, um, you know, if you classify that um, not as a public uh, creditor, that is your own rule in China, but we need to follow an international rule so we need in China uh, to relief developing countries from this debt crisis so that it will not have a ripple effect to develop into a fully fledged global crisis. Mr. Shumi, you have anything to add? Mr. Zumin, and do you have anything to add? Mr. Zumin, do you have anything to add? Mr. Zumin, do you have anything to add? Okay, can you hear? Can you hear? Uh, yes, we hear you. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I think a lot of discussion Hi. about the status of uh, China's state development. And, uh, I myself also involving the financial sector reform. I think we really take efforts to convert this bank from a state and official credit to a commercial bank, which is roughly 10 years ago. So it is an official bank, although he do a lot of development 
finance on the co commercial base. Um, so I think this is the issues, and uh, I think both sides need to sit down to talk. When China become also a major credit, I think the Paris Club also need to consider the China situation and understand the China situation. So then we can work together because Paris Club overall today take account of roughly 10% of over low income countries' deaths. So I think it's a really uh, uh, this deep discussion, understanding and collaborating is the key issue. Hi. Thank you very much. Anyone who wants to speak, uh, please raise your hand. But I would like to ask on Adam Posen, because we have been discussing about the inflation expectation or the uh, dollar appreciation and the increase in the interest rates in the US, which might trigger risks for other parts of the world. And so people express some concerns. The United States uh, need to recover um, on its own from the uh, COVID-19, but also how the United States is going to contribute to the recovery of the entire world from COVID-19. I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, to distinguish between some effects of interest rate rises in the U.S., which result from faster growth versus results from financial market instability. What we are seeing is that the driving up of interest rates in the U.S. at the moment is fundamentally about higher growth expectations. And as has been mentioned by several colleagues and was true in 2008, 9, 10, U.S. tends to import a great deal for every unit of additional GDP. So the spillovers from the rest of the world are positive and substantial. There are a couple countries, notably Brazil and Turkey, that are in Turkey right now because of its own policies uh, that are in deep trouble potentially with financial markets. Brazil, not as much yet, but getting there. And that has more to do with their, frankly, their policies. What, what is striking about this crisis is that the financial sector problems and capital flight are really not the core of the misery for most of the world. What we saw was a year ago at the start of the pandemic in the US, some capital outflow from emerging markets in developing countries, but most of it went back. What we've seen is compared to other cycles of crisis and, Fed and US growth, we've seen more room, including in places like Brazil, more room for countries to pursue expansionary policy and loose monetary policy. So the human vaccine issues and health issues that others have spoken about are critical but the U.S. growth is actually going to benefit the rest of the world pretty well. Thank you very much. Anyone uh, who wants to speak, please raise your hand. But this is something I want to ask Mr. Greco. Europe uh, has a very massive established a massive recovery fund uh, through which the promotion of the digitalization and also the decarbonization are going to be sought. That means creating new industries. So uh, Europe is also pursuing a very dynamic um, uh, moves going forward. But in terms of digital uh, taxations, there is an issue with the United States. So it's the West issue in the Western world, but without um, successfully adjusting them, um, harmonizing them, you will not be uh, successful because everyone has to, uh, you know, face in the same direction. Otherwise, we won't be successful because this recovery from the coronavirus will have to create the new uh, phase of the uh, multilateral cooperation. Otherwise, it won't be. Uh, 
successful. And what is your thought of, uh, of this, Mr. Greco? Are we now entering a new uh, confusion state that we have not seen before? Thanks a lot for these two very crucial questions. I think these are two, two questions. The first uh, relates to the recovery plans and the opportunity that he offers uh, the European states to reform their economies uh, and to uh, start uh, a sustainable and uh, sustained recovery. Of course, uh, all uh, European leaders uh, are focusing very much and governments are focusing very much on the recovery plans and there will be the opportunity to use the funds that, that are, are huge to start uh, an internal reform. I take the case of, for instance, of Italy, but uh, especially into two areas that could be significant improvements uh, if the funds uh, are used uh, in an efficient way. One is uh, technological innovation, in particular the application of uh, digital uh, transformation, so the promotion of digital transformation. There are uh, huge funds for that. And then the second, and not uh, less important, is the green transition. Uh, so that, that's an important element that so far, uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm right, uh, has not been touched upon. Finance could be interested in uh, <laughs> all those plans uh, for the green transitions. Uh, big companies, not only big companies, companies are looking at the opportunity that these plants may offer them to invest and to transform themselves and their, and their production programs. Uh, this applies to Europe, uh, but all to all big economies. And so this should be part of a uh, discussion at the global level, including G20. Uh, if it's possible to introduce new financial instruments to um, help uh, companies to invest on those programs. This is an issue that will be discussed at the level of the G20, for instance. Um, and the second is uh, uh, you, you, you raise the problem of uh, digital tax. Of course, now we have this novelty of the US position, uh, which has changed, and this may help, may open the way for uh, an acceleration negotiation at the level of UACD. Of course, UACD has a key role to play in this. Uh, uh, on this, uh, we will see if uh, there will be a real prospect of reaching an agreement. Uh, what uh, uh, I can say, and this is uh, a widely shared opinion, it would be better if uh, a, a general agreement is reached, otherwise we risk uh, to have uh, much con controversy and, uh, of course, uh, uh, this type of discrepancy in one, uh, uh, just some countries or a region or a block of country introduce this, uh, this tax, uh, at the same time other resist this move, this would be counterproductive. So I, I don't know, frankly, if this move uh, by the US, uh, by the US uh, may change, uh, may be a game changer. Perhaps yes, I hope so, but certain negotiation will be difficult. Uh, and um, I, I don't see if, uh, as uh, some hope, there could be uh, an agreement by July. This is also the debate of uh, the Italian government. Uh, I frankly don't know. I would uh, invite the other speakers to express their opinion on that. So, Mr. Posen, how do you see this yourself? The US and the EU put it uh, a strength, in a strange term. Um, do you think there will be a kind of a reconciliation between the two? Any I think there will be a reconciliation which is already happening, but it will be limited. So you will lose the oh. extreme hostility and amateurishness of the Trump administration treatment of the European Union. And you will see a certain amount of progress like we saw very rapidly, a setting aside or a cooling down of the Airbus Boeing trade dispute. But 
at the end, there are some real issues um, and not so much on substance, but I think the European Union and looking at Chancellor Merkel and President Macron in particular, recognize that the US cannot be depended upon at the current time, because no matter what the Biden administration says, there remains a high risk that in two years time or four years time, the election completely changes US foreign policy again. Uh, less so in two years time, but nonetheless, in terms of things like committing to green goals, which are very important for the world and specifically for Europe. Um, even the Congress, if the Democrats lose the majority in the lower house of Congress, uh, then it's very difficult for the US to make any commitments. And so it is rational for other countries to uh, not be totally convinced or depend on uh, commitments made by the Biden administration, no matter how well intended and no matter how much the Biden administration would like to carry them out. For Japan, it's of course a little different because one of the commonalities, one of the few commonalities, the only commonalities between Trump and Biden administrations is a much higher level of suspicion and aggressiveness towards China than in previous administrations. And there are obviously aspects of that that the Quad and other countries seem to want. Um, and so that is more dependable in just the literal sense of expecting it to continue. Um, so I am hopeful for continued improvement in US-EU relations, but I, unless and until the political situation in the US improves, I'm not sure how much lasting change we can have. Hi. Thank you very much. So what about you, Xu Min? What's your take on that? Xu Min from China. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. I, I would like to follow Adam's uh, comments. I think Adam made a, a very important point about temporary inflation and exit policy effect. I think this is very important to understand. The first point is the US will have a strong economic growth, right? We forecast around 6%, which is 3% over the potential growth of the US. So at the end of this year, US were overheated. I would call Biden overheating. Now, strong US growth is good for US for everyone, right? I also hope US will import more goods from China. But the potential inflation pressure is there. Healthcare is one thing. I think a commerce is another uh, potential area. The only thing, as Adam mentioned, is we don't know those, you know, inflation pressure from one particular sector, whether it will through spill over become a sort of universal inflation expectation and suddenly jump out and forced in some way the Fed to take quick action, and then will have a huge impact on the whole world. Adam say Fed have a more structured approach. Probably they can tell will not do that. I agree, but I hope hope you know we will be able to handle those issues. But we cannot rule out the inflation can come back rapidly and strongly, and that's the real one high risk. But for other countries, including China, I think what we can do is prepare ourselves, right? I mean, we observe what happened in Turkey today. And uh, so build on resilience in domestic policy, build a buffer in fiscal and monetary policy. So I think that's the most important thing for the, the, all the other country to do, to prepare this you know, possible and the potential shock. I think uh, this is also important. On the US-China issues, you talk about US and the Europe. I think the, the outreach talk is good because mm -hmm. at least the both sides sit down to talk, right? I mean, in the past four years, we never talk. I think that's really bad. 
In Obama administration's U.S. China have a 119 or 94 high level conversation. And Trump reduced them to four, then to one, which is three, then to zero. Now we start to talk. I think it's good. I think we both on a small boat, as Larry Summers mentions, both sides have to work out to move forward, which is good for both US and China and for the whole world. I don't think there are other way uh, we can find out will work for both and for the whole world. Thank you once again. Hi, Domo. Thank you very much, Mr. Shuin. Uh, Mr. Rohinton, Medahora, so I'm sure that uh, you are listening to what's being said from a kind of objective perspective. So uh, my question is th the COVID-19 pandemic being uh, prolonged, I think each country needs to address uh, the issue of recovery and uh, China needs to have uh, structural reform internally uh, responding to the service industry expansion and also responding to the aging society. They are talking about dual circulations. Uh, they need to also enhance the domestic uh, circulation and the U.S. needs to also recover the internal domestic industry, which means that everyone is inward looking. They are focusing on their own domestic problem. As we need to address the global issue, but at this stage, uh, each country is focusing on its own domestic policy. So how should we understand this situation? Is this something that cannot be helped at this stage? Or uh, if you think about the open free economy, do we need to explore such open free economy at the same time? While we are focusing on domestic issues, we also need to respond to a possible global issue going forward. We need to come up with a framework to manage such potential uh, global issues going forward. So what are the missing elements here? What's your take on that, Mr. Rohinton? No, I mean, you, you point to a very real dilemma, which is, you know, it's not just a cliche to say that during a pandemic, we're all in it together and you know, no one's safe until everyone's safe. That's all true. On the other hand, the longer term trends, even before COVID, were, were very much in the direction of becoming more inward looking. To be sure, the Trump administration took that to, to, to an extent that was, that was perhaps beyond reasonable. But it is still the case that in the US, there is now a sense, even in this administration, uh, that uh, trade agreements are not, and the globalization that we have seen has not really helped the inequity situation in the U.S. And I think there's some skepticism, although the Biden administration has been much more supportive and has sort of broken the logjam in the headship of the WTO, come out in favor, although not in any specificity, for a new uh, tranche of SDRs. It is still the case there's, there's a sense that the U.S. must look out for itself in its economic interests, and that's fair enough. We have known for some time in the Chinese case that the model has to rebalance towards domestic consumption and not be purely outward looking. And the EU has been sort of inwardly consumed for some time as well. And so how you balance those two is something that's going, to, that's going to take time. And as I mentioned previously, and we didn't have time to get into it, investments in new technologies take time to show up in productivity growth. They might show up in some forms of welfare growth, but very difficult to measure all the investments we're making in AI and robotics for at least another decade or so. So I think you add all of that up, and it's not clear whether there's an engine of growth that's actually going to translate into an international engine of great growth. To be sure, when the US grows, everyone benefits, but the spillover effects aren't as strong and the multiplier effects aren't as strong as they used to be. This said, there are two or three areas in international cooperation where I think the important countries and the G20 especially, and here I agree with it, or could make a difference. I think we should pay a lot of attention to the question of IP around vaccine. Uh, 
I think even a smallish but uh, symbolic uh, SDR tranche would mean a lot to the countries that need it the most. And we could think uh, w once more about creating a sort of systematic way to unravel sovereign debt issues. We don't have an SDRM, we haven't ever, and this might be the goose that sort of allows us to do so. So we shouldn't forget that there are some gaps in global cooperation that COVID has reminded us of, and they can be addressed without compromising important domestic priorities. Uh, we are running out, out of time, but the, um, I would like to um, ask our first speakers, uh, please speak for one minute, one last minute. And in the uh, post-COVID-19 um, recovery, we are trying to see the uh, exit uh, strategy and what is needed in just one word. And you can just uh, take 30 seconds, not one minute, just one minute, one word, what, what is needed for the uh, uh, exit from the uh, uh, recovery. So uh, starting with Okamura-san. I think the US and China and their confrontation or China's decoupling, uh, which has been the uh, theme of discussion uh, for all along. But when we think about the future of globalization, the confrontation between the US and China, uh, you know, affect, you know, changing or stopping the flow of globalization. I think that's not the uh, uh, nature of the confrontation, especially in economics. Already, uh, we have a very deep and very intricate um, um, uh, interchanges and the uh, exchanges, and it's impossible for us to stop that or to make it a reverse. And so, the uh, you know, how we can cope with the uh, uh, COVID or the uh, cyber attacks? These are the areas uh, we need to work on the common rules. And within the common rules, we should try to resolve the issues. The U.S. and China. And, and rather, we should integrate China uh, in that area of common rules. What about you, Ms. Mr. Zhu Min? Uh, this is your last uh, chance to speak. Only one minute left. Mr. Zhu Min. Yeah, thank you. Two points. The first point is for China, really, the current task is not the recovery from COVID 19, because China is more or less recovered in year 2020. So year 2021 and next five years, 10 years, is really for China move into a long green sustainable growth path. So that's the task. So that means more green, more sustainable, more technology, more digitalization, and with a structure change, structure reform, with open and reform. I think that's, the, that's the, for China. And for U.S. and China, I'm cautious uh, optimistic, but more on, on the optimistic side, side. I think that we, today, the key issues, we do see U.S. and China has a conflict in, in various things. But another issue is we do see these two big economies have to live together, which is inevitable. I don't think we can reverse globalization. I don't think we can decouple these two huge economies. So in that sense, when Joe Biden move in, when we go back to negotiation table, I think we will be able to gradually move forward, which is good for both country and for the whole world. Mr. Adam Posen, uh, this is your last chance to speak. Thank you again for having me. I want to pick up on what my colleague Rohit said. Um, while I focused my remarks on the U.S. because of what the chair requested, the international agenda of providing vaccines, of increasing the SDR, of providing debt restructuring and relief where needed, this is a critical agenda for humankind, but also in the rich country's self-interest, including the US. 
my colleagues, Chad Bown and Morris Feld have been leading the way on some of the proposals in this regard. And we very strongly, I very strongly believe the US should be taking advantage of this opportunity to do the right thing. Hi. Thank you very much. Carlos, this is really, really the, the last, but you are the last person to finish this session. Carlos, are you there? Sorry. Uh, Carlos, I'm muted. Of all, Carlos, you are muted. Yes, you are, are you muted. Are you listening? Are you listening? Yes, yes, we hear you. All right, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me say, uh, say the following. I think that uh, there is somehow uh, a very big difficulty. Many countries are already in what uh, Keynes uh, called the liquidity trap. In order to get out of the liquidity trap, you need some Keynesian policies. And those in a world that has capital mobility are more difficult than in the 1930s. And therefore you would need coordination, but that stops short of geopolitical competition between China and the US. So I believe that we are going to have for 10 difficult years ahead with a lot of competition. And the only way out is through innovation. There will be competition and innovation. But both China and the US, and China mimic at the US and that, they innovate first investing in their military. So, uh, and from there it spills over to the rest of the economy. So it is a big question if we are going into a different world from the past 80 years uh, that we lived under the Pax Americana. This will be a world of stark competition. And I think that geopolitics, fi finance, um, money, in other words, they interfere in every dimension. Uh, they interact in every possible dimension. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we are three minutes and uh, extended uh, from uh, for this session. In this session, we talked about the recovery from COVID-19, but at the same time, we also wanted to discuss about the globalization. But the um, economic recovery from the COVID-19 is too big for us to even start talking about the globalization issue. And uh, we cannot uh, just be optimistic, but in, in, in a way, uh, you have to be cautious even if you have optimism in your heart but um, i think it was very good that we were able to share our thoughts on this theme and the question uh, for us is that the how the world is going to cope with these issues and challenges and these issues uh, probably we will continue to talk about um, today after this and also the, tomorrow and then we had uh, four uh, panelists and also two members from our think tank participants and thank you for your participation and cooperation thank you Thank you very much for all the panelists in this um, economic session so this concludes the uh, second session Thank you.